we thought we'd, we'd uh, open, I'd talk a little bit about the app for so First of all, my name is Rob Chenduk. I do software strategy for the semiconductor business at Qualcomm and a couple of other things. Um, one of the things we really want to talk about today is something that we're really proud of, which is the S4 chipsets that are out right now, and some of the reviews that have been coming out. Um, we think about chips a little bit differently than perhaps um, either most consumers think about them at the top level, or perhaps some of you think about where our focus is not on the numbers of cores and the numbers of um, sort of numerical statistics we can give out. What we're really about is trying to drive a user experience. So one of the things we really focused on in the S4 series, whether it's the instance of the S4 that is dual core or quad core, is actually what happens when you hold that phone using that chip in your hand. So we do a lot of system level optimizations that we think actually lead to the uh, results that I don't need to read for you that we're very, very proud of. It's always a delicate thing to talk about one design is better than another design. So I'm going to leave to you to ask questions about whether four is actually better than two and uh, whether size matters and so forth. But the the thing that we really want, to, want you to walk away with is the level of effort that we take in integrating the software and the experience with the hardware that we design. So when we think about how we're going to define these chips, we think about how every bit of the experience is going to work, and we think about that entire pipeline. So when Anand talks about the performance advantages that we have, it's really because we've spent a lot of time not thinking about just how fast the CPU is going to be, but the balance between the CPU, the GPU, the DSP, all the components of the hardware chain, and how they relate to today's modern operating systems. Um, I think for a lot of people, this would be a pretty surprising result to see that there are actually dual core solutions out there, the S4 in particular from Qualcomm. Our Snapdragon processor actually outperforms in general in most quad cores. In fact, every quad core that I know. And it's, again, not because of anything that we, any one thing that we did, but it's the overall systems approach that we took to it. And it's, an, it's a result that is perhaps not intuitive because it always seems like more is better. We can actually spread the processing load over the different CPUs and, and uh, actually it should be just sort of scale. But if you look back at the performance in the PC world, if you look back at the performance where we, we are, the amount of incremental benefit you get from every core, of course, drops off because software has to be highly parallel to actually take advantage of that. And what we've instead focused on is the actual overall performance of the system. We're going to make sure you can get a soft copy of these slides so taking pictures of my screen is not the only thing that you'll be able to do. This next slide I'm going to put up is, is perhaps one that I, I, I... It's the message I'd really like to get across, one of the pieces here. Um, when you start to take the high performance that we're talking about and drive it into the packaging and the size that we're talking about, when you hold two and four, you know, over one gigahertz um, processors in your hand, what then becomes the design challenge that we're actually facing? And it turns out one of the biggest design challenges is how you drive the compute in that form factor without having it melt, basically, in all honesty. So up here, what we're trying to show you is the difference in the kind of architectural approach that we take and some of the architectural approaches that um, result from how our competitors um, chips work. And the pictures that actually are, are trying to show you the thermal um, imaging of what happens to these devices over a 5, 10, 20 minute time. So one of the questions we'd like you to think about when you're evaluating both our, our devices and our competitors' devices is not just how fast can this device run, but how long can it run that fast, right? Because it turns out what we focus on is when we give you a number and we give you a performance spec, is something that actually is sustainable, right? So it's something, if we give you a, a quote on a performance, it's because it's that, that performance can be sustained over a period of time. So ask those questions, both of us, because we want you to keep us honest, but also of our competitors, of when you quote that multi-gigahertz number, for how long can you actually do that? 
because it turns out as we go forward that this is going to be one of the things that actually drives both um, how, how we can build devices, the form factors they can take, but also how much processing power we can actually put into what form factor. Right? So this is something that we, we really work on. So this is, a, this is a direct result of us saying that in the Snapdragon um, architecture, and particularly with the crate um, uh, microarchitecture, we focused on performance at a particular power budget. Right? So it's not just performance at any cost, it's performance at a particular power budget. And what that translates to over time is performance over a sustained period of time, so that when we give you a number, it actually works. The last bit I'll talk about before Serge gets to get into the exciting world of mode technology is, um, is the graphics performance. You may have noticed uh, yesterday that we actually made an announcement about um, an upgrade to our S4 <coughs> line for the S4 Pro. So these numbers here are actually with the um, Adreno graphics score, the 225, that's in the original uh, 8960, the first of the S4 line. The GPU that we announced in the S4 in the S4 line is actually, in some benchmarks, um, up to four times the performance of this GPU, and you can see how well this one actually performs. So if you combine this with the information that I was trying to show in the earlier slides, um, you can see that we think we're going to set a new standard here for performance in mobile space. And it's something that we really want um, our partners to use to drive really amazing consumer experiences. Um, so with that, I'm going to actually leave it to Sarah, and then we're going to take some comments and questions. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, Rob. My name is uh, Serge Villeneger. I'm with the uh, semiconductor division as well, uh, heading the uh, cellular technology portfolio management uh, within the product management organization. So I'm going to. Uh, share with you a few updates on what we're doing with our Gobi modem and um, start with where we are in terms of uh, LTE integration. We announced uh, this week our third, some, some additional details on our third generation um, LTE chipset. To put things in perspective and context, we started with the uh, first generation that uh, integrated already uh, six <coughs> nodes from the start, including TBD and FTD LTE. And that was delivered in an MDM package, which means enables the uh, data devices and can be um, coupled with an application processor to deliver the smartphones that are on the market today. We then moved on to the uh, second generation, which was primarily about improving the power, the level of integration, and that enabled us to integrate the modem with an application processor, the S4, into a common package and that resulted in the MSME 960. So we are from first generation to establish the technology, already multi-mode from day one. Second generation, improve the, uh, the uh, metrics in terms of power area that enabled us to integrate with the AP and set the stage for tiering LTE to the the lower tiers and propagate LTE across our portfolio. And now we're moving on to the third generation where we're adding functionality. And the main functionality that uh, we've announced this week is Gobi Cat4 LTE, which is really uh, combining with LTE carrier enables the true Cat4 capability for most of the carriers around the world. And the reason it's important to understand this association of CAT4 and, and the, uh, the capability they've announced together with carrier aggregation is the following. Yes, everyone is well aware that uh, the spectrum available for LTE is uh, relatively fragmented compared to historical benchmark of what we have with 2G and 3G. And that can, kind of gives you the picture uh, we have to deliver uh, in the order of about 40 bands if you want to address all our customers from the world. We've already launched a number of these bands. We've launched our solution in all the region, regions across the world. And we 
support most of these bands listed here. As you'll note, except for Europe, most of the allocations for each of these bands very rarely um, give any single operator 20 MHz of continuous spectrum. Practically, this means most of the operators don't have the ability today to exploit the full potential of LTE. LTE has been defined as a 20 MHz system. It scales down to 10, 5, 1 and quarter uh, bandwidth. But really, to get the full experience, you need 20 MHz of, of, of spectrum. So what we enable with carrier aggregation is essentially the ability for carriers to combine different spectrum assets and obtain this 20 MHz bandwidth that unleashes the full potentials, potential of LTE. So that's why we, we I'm sure this will build the, a lot of announcement about category 4 LTE, 150 megabit per second LTE. There is a difference between the Gobi Cat4 LTE that we deliver and, and the other Cat4 LTE solutions. And that difference is the fact that we deliver it with this carrier aggregation capability. And that's part of 3 gbp release 10, which also referred to as LTE Advanced. So it enables higher peak rates, which is kind of a nominal reference. Obviously, the, the peak rate uh, typically is not achieved in, in, in uh, regular operation in the network. But the average user rate experimented by the, the end user, typically in a um, low loaded network or medium loading network, would translate uh, proportionally to the end user throughput. So you double the peak rate um, from cat. You go from cat three, sorry, to cat four. The end user throughput scales proportionally unless the network is loaded. And actually, networks most of the time are not loaded. Um, <coughs> so, um, moving on to uh, that, that's kind of what we're doing to uh, make sure that the data pipe, the mobile broadband channel, is as as broad and consistent as possible across all the carriers around the world, irrespective of their spectrum assets. So now we have the pipe. We are also focusing with our global model on the services that can be enabled through that, uh, through that mobile broadband channel. Obviously, voice is very important service. It's actually the foundation of the, uh, the mobile industry. And we, we have a roadmap for voice that we, we have uh, talked about. We have some demos uh, on this. And one of the reasons it's progressive goes with the, uh, the way the market is evolved compared to 3G. So we first launched data-only solutions. Then we supported voice in a way that is dual radio, um, LTE, um, 2G or 3G radio, or secret switch fallback when the uh, legacy network is UMTS that enables multi-RAP capability, that means voice and data simultaneously. And then the next phase that uh, we are um, focusing on uh, today, and actually we've announced uh, a milestone with Ericsson on this, is to integrate the voice capability directly in LTE, and that's the so-called so Voltaic. I think as Rob mentioned earlier, our focus is not just delivering the, tele the capability check and move on to the next feature. What we're really focused on is to deliver quality of experience that is consistent with what uh, the end users have come to expect from um, mobile con connectivity, meaning ubiquitous, uh, roaming, available anywhere, anytime, consistently. So that's why those features, acronyms, they're a little bit difficult to grasp. But the bottom line of what we're trying to do here is to ensure that the, the basic communication services that everyone has come to expect from uh, mobile communication are available on LTE in a way that's consistent with, with the uh, baseline ex expectation that 2G and 3G have set. We'll take it one step further. I think 
once we have that baseline communication services, mobile broadband, and the INS platform, that will enable the operators to develop additional services in a way that they haven't been able to, to develop them so far. And we're going to focus very much in the, in the coming years uh, on this, and we'll hear more on this from us and other partners. The other service that uh, we, uh, we've announced is EMBMS, and that's really more about anticipating the load that will be uh, achieved on, on those daily networks. We all know about the amazing growth in traffic that the operators have to deal with. And we believe that the, uh, the structure of the traffic is such that the operators have an ability to deliver the bits more effectively in certain cases with the multicast approach. Um, we are essentially <coughs> enabling this capability and enabling the operators to beyond the baseline LTE, which is already a step forward in terms of overall efficiency, bring another level of efficiency to the network, reduce the cost structure of delivering bits to the end user. That's EMBMS, we are demonstrating this with uh, Ericsson, and uh, we expect this to, uh, to be commercialized in, uh, in 2013. So the Gobi modem that we're delivering is multi-mode, multi-band, and is focused on delivering uh, quality of service for the services that the end users are going to expect. It's tiered, uh, it's, it's set to be tiered across all sorts of platforms, smartphones, tablets, uh, internet of everything, and uh, other networking configurations. And we're again focusing on this consistent quality of service, seamless support of baseline communication services and mobile broadband performance. In addition, we've announced the uh, fifth generation Gobi reference platform that will uh, act as a catalyst for the integration of mobile broadband connectivity in all sorts of devices. So with the fifth generation, what we're announcing is worldwide connectivity, which is sort of taking one level beyond in that it enables also worldwide LT connectivity. So we, we already had established the worldwide 3G connectivity with the previous Gobi generations. We're taking it to the next level, adding LTE, which comes in different reference configurations for Europe, Asia, and North America because you've seen the 40 bands, there's no one single platform can handle 40 different bands, but we're trying to establish clusters for the different region and make it um, essentially kind of moving to a plug and play model a little bit. We're also um, moving to enable uh, additional form factors up to now, the, uh, the Gobi platform, reference platform, has been very focused on, on the laptops. And we're moving to enable uh, additional form factor, tablet form factor, as an example. And the third element of the, uh, the announcement is that we're um, extending support for major OS, including um, Windows 8. I think I've covered the, uh, the different aspects of what we've introduced this week uh, relative to the model. Um, and we really believe that uh, there is LT modems and there is Gobi LT modems. Um, that's what we're focusing on, obviously. Thank you very much.